Hey, welcome back to Malta Baptist Church. As you know, tomorrow is Memorial Day. And on behalf of the church, we are truly grateful for the many men and women that have given their lives for our country. The freedom we have, this is the greatest country to live in. And we're truly blessed and thankful for the many people that sacrifice their lives so that we might have the freedom we have today. Hey, and if you're serving in the military right now, we're also truly grateful for your service. May God continue to bless this wonderful country we have. Let me pray for you. Father, we do thank you for your love, allowing us to come and worship you today. Truly grateful for the men and women that have given their lives so we can have the freedom we have. We know the greatest freedom we can possess is Jesus Christ. Because you are true freedom. If you are living in our lives, we have the greatest thing possible. We have your presence, your love, your grace, your mercy. Father, we thank you for the many men and women that have given their lives. Most of all, we thank you for your son who died on the cross so that we might be eternally free. I pray we are all experiencing true freedom. The freedom which comes from you in Jesus Christ. Thank you for today. We ask all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. This morning we'll be looking at Matthew chapter 11, the first six verses. It says, when Jesus had finished giving instructions to his 12 disciples, he moved on from there to teach and preach in their towns. Now, when John heard in prison what the Christ was doing, he sent a message through his disciples and asked him, are you the one who is to come? Or should we expect someone else? Jesus replied to them, Go and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, those with leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the poor are told the good news. Blessed is the one who isn't offended by me. This morning, have you ever had buyer's remorse? And what happens at many times, someone makes a purchase. They start to doubt. Was that the right decision? Was it a good decision? Did I really need to purchase this thing? Did, did I pay too much? Oftentimes, it causes stress. You, you just can't move on from it. You're wondering if you made the right choice, the right purchase. In, in Matthew chapter 11, there's something kind of similar happening. It's about John's struggle with life's decisions. There may be times when we struggle with the same choice and decision that John is faced with. If we go back to verse 1. When Jesus had finished giving instructions to his 12 disciples, he moved on from there 
to teach and preach in their towns. Jesus had just sent out the 12 disciples to do ministry on, on their own. It was the next phase in their discipleship. They had walked with Jesus. They talked with Jesus. They learned from him. And now it was time for them to go out. And so he sends them out on their own to practice what, what they've learned, what they've witnessed. Verse 2. Now when John heard in prison what the Christ was doing, he sent a message through his disciples. So let's back up. We need to understand who John was. He was not simply a man of significance. He was super significant. He was a man of natural prominence, greatly admired, followed by thousands. He was someone that people looked up to. They loved him because he was a prophet of God. Here's the thing we also need to understand. Israel had not heard from God for 400 years since the death of the prophet Malachi to John's birth, 400 years of silence from heaven, not a single prophet, not a single angelic appearance, no miracles, nothing. And then suddenly appearing on the scene is this unusual prophet John the Baptist dressed in animal skins with a diet of locust and wild honey. So he, he was a little different to say the least, but he captured the imagination of the people and they loved him. In fact, John was so popular, some thought he might be the actual Messiah. We know that was not his role. He was to prepare the way for the Messiah. He was the voice calling or crying in the wilderness. We love this verse here. It says that, that I must decrease, that Jesus must increase. I believe that was John's motto. He lived that. He believed it. it so it was his point to point people to Jesus Christ. And when Jesus began his public ministry after John baptized him in the Jordan River, John said, Behold, he is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. It, though John had his own followers, he said, Listen, hey, my work is done. Follow Jesus from this point forward. He was simply to prepare the way for Jesus. And here he is to follow him. John was in prison because he had a run-in with Herod's ex-sister-in-law and now wife. He held to the truth, and that commitment to God's truth landed him in jail. John had done everything right, but was suffering for doing the right thing. Jesus tells us later that John was the greatest man ever born up until that time. Now, sometimes it's crazy in life. When we are doing the right things for Jesus Christ, the world, well, the world doesn't like it. But let me encourage you to keep keeping on with Jesus Christ. Keep doing what is right. 
the greatest life we can live. Remember in two, he sent a message through his disciples, verse three, and asked him, are you the one who is to come? Or should we expect someone else? He sent word by his disciples and said to him, Are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? John the Baptist was confused. Probably being in prison messed with his mind. He's thinking, How is it I've done everything right and now I'm being punished for it. Am I wrong to believe you are the Messiah? Well, John, he believed Jesus was the Messiah. He announced his coming. He announced his presence. He baptized him. He gave his entire life to announcing Jesus as the Messiah to come, but, but he's suffering, as we said, for good, doing what God called him to do. He's thinking, well, did I miss something? Am I wrong about Jesus? It's not making any sense. And then to make matters worse, Jesus is not doing what John thinks he should be doing. The problem that John and many others was they thought Jesus was going to establish his kingdom then and there. They thought he was going to overthrow Rome. Rome is still in control though. Things were as bad as ever. People were not getting out of prison. And then John was starting to hear rumors coming back that Jesus was hanging out with some pretty questionable characters. He was probably thinking, have I made a mistake? Well, everything was going exactly as it was supposed to go. It's just that John misunderstood because scripture clearly taught that the Messiah would establish his kingdom on the earth. He would suffer and die. Listen, before Jesus would wear many crowns, he would first wear the crown. A crown made of thorns. Before he would sit on the throne, he would first be nailed to a cross. This is what Scripture taught. And if they had carefully studied the Word of God, they would have read passages like Psalm 22 and Isaiah 53 that spoke extensively about the suffering of Jesus, of the Messiah. But because maybe they had failed to read or they just simply misunderstood his role, John is asking the question, are you the one? Did we misunderstand this? Listen, doubt is a matter of the mind. Unbelief is a matter of the will. Doubt says, I don't get it. Help me understand this. Work with me through this. I, I want to know. Unbelief says, I get it. I don't like it. I refuse to accept it. So here, John was simply doubting it wasn't unbelief. This morning, if you are having doubts, if you're struggling with some issues, you're not the only one. Here's the thing with John. He's not asking 
asking for information as much as confirmation. Maybe, Lord, explain this to me again. Did I get this right? Are you the Messiah? Are you the one that we've been looking for? And so he's dealing with these issues and trying to make sense of them. Pick it up back and forth. Jesus replied to them, Go and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight. The lame walk. Those with leprosy are cleansed. The deaf hear. The dead are raised. The poor are told the good news. Go tell John the following. No, John, I am not leading a revolt. No, I am not going to overthrow Rome. But tell him what I am doing. I'm removing disabilities wherever I see them. I'm bringing men and women into a right relationship with God. And when that is right, everything else will change as well. Jesus didn't give a simple yes or, or no answer. He did more than that. He answered John's questions with results. Go tell John what you've heard and seen. Everything you expect the Messiah to do, he, uh, it's being done. Everything the Son of God was promised to do is doing it. Blind people now see, crippled people are walking, diseased people are cured, deaf people are hearing, dead people are alive again. The good news of God's love for all people is being proclaimed to those nobody else loves. Go back and tell John what you're seeing. Go back and tell John what you've heard. Go back and tell him everything you see God doing. Aren't you glad Jesus was acting according to the Father's will, not the will of humans? If we would simply let God be God and let God do what he wants to do, how better off would we be? We think we know better. We think we know all things. We think our way is the best. Newsflash, it's not. All we're going to do, all we can do is mess it up. If we would just let Jesus Christ be Jesus Christ. Let Jesus be Jesus in our lives. Verse 6, he finishes it up and he says, And blessed is the one who isn't offended by me. In the original language, this verse says, do not let all of this be a stumbling block. Jesus tells them to go and tell John not to let what's happening to him cause him to stumble. Tell John not to let his circumstances cause him to stumble in his trust of Jesus as the Messiah. I like this explanation. Jesus' divine messiahship and the good news of deliverance from sin through faith in him are great stumbling blocks to sinful, unbelieving man. And Jesus did not want John to be affected by the world's unbelief. So he was effectively saying, John, hold your course. I know it's hard. I know you don't get it all right now. You might not understand it. I know it, it isn't making sense to you, but I'm asking you to hold on. That's what we need to do. Lord, I don't understand this right now. Does it make sense? 
He says, I know that, but I'm in control. Stay the course. Don't be stumbled because of this. One day everything will come into focus when we see Jesus Christ face to face. We'll discover the Lord that he wasn't just sitting on his hands. We know, as a matter of fact, those hands were nailed to a cross because of us. He knew we needed a Savior. He knew we needed a way back to the Father. He knew we needed a way of eternal life. And it's only through Jesus Christ. You know, I believe we have all these questions. God, we, we think we're going to ask him, God, why did this happen? Why was this? Why was that? I don't think we're going to ask him any of those things. Because think about it. We will be in the presence of Almighty God. All things will be changed. We will all be new. There will be no more crying. No more mourning. The old things have passed away. The new has come. I don't believe it's going to matter. But until that time, we have to hold on to Jesus Christ. I know there are times I have the same feelings that we just don't understand. We serve him the best we can. We live the best life we can to, to bring glory and praise to him. But then it, things get out of control. Things happen that blindside us. And that seems to be what John was thinking about. He had done everything just as God told him. He had given his whole life to pointing people to Jesus Christ as God's chosen one. And all he got was a jail cell and eventually would lose his head. All this confused John. He may have been having second thoughts about what he'd given his life for. Does the, that sound familiar? It, it does. We, we, we do the same thing. Why is this happening? Why do bad things happen to good people? But we need to simply say, Jesus Christ, I trust you. I'm giving you everything I am and that I have for you. What do we do? What should we do when we find ourselves in that place? We need to simply cry out to Jesus Christ. If you remember the story, there was a man who brought his son to Jesus to cast out an evil spirit. And he told Jesus, if you can, help my son. And Jesus said, if I can, do you not believe and the man cried out, Jesus, I believe, help my unbelief. That's what Jesus can do for us today. If you have any type of doubt, he can help that doubt. In order to doubt something, you first must possess it. That's the cool thing about doubt. If you've never had a relationship with Jesus Christ, how can you doubt it? That's a great thing. I'll close with this illustration. A guy was visiting a logging area in the Northwest United States, and he watched a lumberjack walking alongside a mountain stream, and periodically he would jab his sharp hook onto a log and pull it apart from the others and separate it. The guy asked the logger what he was doing. The man said, well, you know, these logs may all look alike to you, but I recognize that some of them are quite different. The ones that I pass are from trees that are grown in a valley where they're always protected from the storms. The grain on those logs is rather coarse. But the logs I pull aside from high up 
in the mountains where they are beaten by strong winds from the time they are quite small. This toughens the trees and gives them a fine grain. They are too good to be used for ordinary lumber. Maybe you are facing the wind or the winds of adversity right now and you wonder why. Could it be that God is allowing this to toughen the grain in your life, letting you go through hardship so you'll be able to do something unique that he has in store for you? Whatever you are facing today, you don't have to face it alone because God cares. He loves us. He loves you. He's the only one that can give us the strength to go through whatever we are facing. Whatever you are facing, go through it with God. I know many times the circumstances of our lives can be completely overwhelming. They're confusing. It, it might even lead to some doubts. If we ever find ourselves there or if we are there now, we have a choice. We can choose not to let our circumstances control our hearts. We can choose that despite all that's going on, we are going with God. We can make the choice right now, no matter what is bombarding us, to choose to believe Jesus is who he says he is. Choose to believe Jesus has done what he has said he would do. And choose to believe that no matter what may come, we will trust him. It's not a greater promise than we can find or have in Jesus Christ because he is everything he says he is. He's done everything he said he would do. He loves us more than we will ever know. He cares about us more than we can ever fathom. He is trustworthy. Trust Jesus Christ today. He is who he says he is. He will always be Jesus Christ. He will always be the truth, the way, and the life. And it can only come through Jesus Christ. Father, thank you for today. Wherever we find ourselves, may we truly turn our hearts and our eyes to Jesus Christ. Because you are faithful and true. You love us and you care for us. You know what we're going through right here and now. No matter what it is, you're here for us. So Father, just continue to strengthen us, lead and guide us in the way you would have us to go, that we will turn our eyes upon Jesus Christ and just trust in your everlasting way. Thank you for loving us, for caring for us, your mercy and your grace. Thank you for the freedom we have in Jesus Christ. And we ask all this in your name. Amen.